Hello, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage here at SAS Innovate 2024. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, with my co-host and co-founder, Dave Vellante, extracting the seat from there. He's got a great return guest, Jay Upchurch, CIO at SAS, was on yesterday. He's got a guest on with him, Sri Raghavan, who's a principal technology partnerships data analyst at Amazon Web Services, AWS. Sri, great to see you. It's great Jay, to be here. Great to come back, good to see you. Thank you. So this Thanks is a fun CIO, AWS, I mean this is going to be, I think, a nice cloud conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Lots going on in the managed service, so right. uh, welcome back. And a lot of work going on with AWS and partnership. Let's talk about the partnership update with AWS. Um, so, uh, fantastic partnership. In fact, award-winning partnership, I would add, yesterday. Yes. You Thank you very much for that, we're thrilled. Yeah, tell us a little bit about it real quick. Yeah, so yesterday we were called upon and were given an award the day before actually um, as the Cloud and Technology Partner of the Year with SAS. Right. And we couldn't be more grateful, obviously, to get an award like this, uh, it takes a village. And there's a tremendous team on the AWS side as well as on the SAS side who've been working hand in glove for the past, uh, I think, four years or so. And we're here at the culmination of that with an award. Right. and with all kinds of signed agreements, contractual agreements in place for us to invest in the SaaS business. So, long story short, if I haven't repeated myself many, many times, I'm going to repeat myself once again. Yeah. We're thrilled to be in this partnership. This is a great partner to be in business with, and we're extremely thankful and grateful for that. Thank you. Jay, we just had Brian on and talked about the, that you do the hard work, you get the right product mix, the results will be on the scoreboard. That's my word, he didn't say that directly, but he said the revenue will be a result of that. The SaaS managed offering is doing well, Okay, well. and so that's proof in the pudding. There's something going on there. Give us the update of what the key, key to success is. Uh, oof, key to success. Well, let's talk about the results first. Yep. So yes, absolutely, SaaS Managed Services as a portfolio continues to excel. We're incredibly proud of it. It's probably the fastest growing part of the SaaS umbrella. Uh, last year we enjoyed 30% growth in the managed services. The, today's announcement with AWS expands our hosted managed services offering within that portfolio through uh, AWS. Um, and we are really excited about it because we're meeting our customers where they want to be. There have been strong demand signals for the last few years from our customers that said, hey, not only will we take Via and run it because it's cloud portable and cloud agnostic, you can run it where you want, they, they enjoyed having it there, but they wanted SaaS's expertise yeah. to install, configure, run, and operate it for them. And so we're meeting them where they are and empowering that choice that we've given them. So, Go ahead. so what is the strategy for moving customers to the cloud. I mean, as a CIO, you could lift and shift, you could lift and modernize. Yeah. Um, wh what would you do uh, if you were one of your customers? And, and, and what does that mean for, for Via? Well, I, my experience, and I love Sheree's opinion on this too, every customer is different. There are customers who are running from a problem in an end of life, into support, mm -hmm. hardware, software issue, maybe a compliance issue, and it may be time requires you to lift and shift, and maybe others where we have the luxury of time and we can modernize and migrate at the same time. In our case, we have a lot of customers, a massive SAS9 installation. They're hungry for the Via innovation that you've heard about at the show. They want to go. Some can make that leap, that modernization and migration in one step. Others need to pace it. So we try to meet our customers again where they are in their cloud journey. Uh, the good news is, you know, we're a couple years into this, right? Mm -hmm. We've, we've, got, we've um, learned a lot as we've gone, and so our ability to get our customers there safely, so we de-risk de the move, has been really key to our success, and frankly, our customer success. And the drivers for that growth are just the need for more analytics in, in the cloud? Is there an AI driver here? What, what's, what's the tailwind? Absolutely, there's an AI need, there's an analytics need. Um, Jay said it right, um, we meet the customers where they are, uh, which is why the two companies get along so very well, because it's not just about us, okay. or the technology, or our infrastructure, it's about what the customer needs are. And there are two parts to it, right? One is being cloud native, yep. and one is being cloud ready. Cloud ready is relatively easier because you can lift and shift and make sure they take advantage of the cloud. Cloud native is a little bit more difficult in the sense that a lot more engineering effort needs to happen. But behind all those things, particularly with SaaS, with the customer base that SaaS has across healthcare, financial services, manufacturing, you name it, the numbers of use cases are diverse, as are the analytic needs. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that, there are many different kinds of analytics which usually comes into play, which is typically we call it multi-genre analytics. SaaS provides a phenomenal base of those kinds of analytics which are in play, 
which are complemented by analytics which is available from us, like SageMaker models and whatnot, as well as, let's not forget, in this day and age, the generative AI piece. Yeah. What can we do to bring in, for instance, with Customer 360, we're providing support with generative AI to be able to deliver content which then SaaS takes and yeah. passes it on to customers who are now able to have a very, very near real-time experience as far as their journey with their retailers or with their healthcare providers or with the banks are concerned. This is a classic example of two technologies coming into play. So yes, analytics is a part of it, infrastructure yeah. is a part of it, SaaS's ability to manage very complex installations with security, with, uh, with the ability to serve up data in real time, all those things become very crucial. And, and diverse, you mentioned diverse, but also expanding because with VIA Workbench, you're going to see a, a growth of users and developers, both on the democratization side Absolutely. as well as on the developer side. So I think that's, that's a great call out point there. The thing that interested me yesterday on stage was the customer mm -hmm. had Amazon on the chart. I took a screenshot of it. It says Amazon Web Services at the bottom. That's right. Okay, and then the rest of that AI stack was SaaS and customer. That's right. No flashy, shiny new toy in there right. from anything else. Pure cloud and work, work a stack built by the customer. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, that's production workload. So again, this is the year of the Let's see who's got, who can bring the production workloads to the table. Yeah, so in that case, that customer case, that was Georgia Pacific, one of our you know, wonderful customers shared with, with AWS. That technology stack has evolved between all three parties, right? We've continued to evolve and push. They have over 10,000 models yeah. in production today, saving them millions of dollars in yeah. manufacturing. Uh, it's a fantastic story. And that, and that um, um, piece of the stack at the, at the bottom was, was SageMaker got the call out, which was interesting. Yep. I was with Matt Wood a couple weeks ago in yep. New York City. I don't want to give the exact number because I'm not sure I remember correctly, but a very large proportion of the workloads and the problems can be solved with SageMaker was the statement he made. And, and I, it was more than 50%. Yeah. And so and Gen AI is maybe you know, the, the orchestrator, and in this case, Via is actually the orchestrator bringing some tooling that is really more use case specific for your customers. That's right. That by, uh, as well as integration in with our ES, uh, ES product, so that event streaming protocol yeah. has been yeah. incredibly mm -hmm. important yeah. to our manufacturing vertical. Um, and so those two things together kind of initiated so much of where Georgia Pacific was going. Came in with the AWS foundational piece and I think we've enjoyed yeah. tremendous success together yeah. and a great customer. That's why I like that because it's generative AI, one of the things I love about generative AI is, I mean besides the, I like hype by the way, but as long as it gets reality comes in, and it is, the, the hype is, the reality is matching the hype yeah. in a very right. compressed scale. So I think cloud helps that too and the yeah. data, having the data will do and, that. And, and but I like mind, that. There's one point that Jamie, I didn't okay, mean to interrupt, ahead. really, really quickly. Okay. 10,000 models, it's a lot of models. Oh yeah. Right? It's, it's a massive number. To do model management is not easy. Anybody can create these models and bring them and put them in production. But over time, you have to look at things like championship, challenger right. models, you need to look at how model DK happens. I cannot think of a better partnership where you bring two technologies together to be able to manage this massive number of machine learning models which are in place for you to yeah. address things like you know, demand or customer journey, fraud detection, what have you. I mean, that's... That's something stupendous we're looking at. I'm glad you mentioned security. It was a tweet by Adam today, did you see it? No, I did not. No, he was basically pounding AWS's chest, which is the right thing to do about security. It's always been, I'll be, I'll be at Reinforce in June, uh, this year it's in Philly, and it is something. You guys, you know what? AWS has never been a big security monetizer, it's just there. You had some products that you can buy, but it's always been about, it's built in, and so I was glad to see that, that tweet. I'm glad, he, glad you brought that up, Sri. It is a big part of what we do. We have to, uh, simply because you know, we have many regulated industries. Security has never been an afterthought, and now we're, we're making sure people understand that. So Sw Swami also tweeted about the Llama 3 as well, saw that tweet. Um, that brings up the whole diversity piece of it. So yes. model diversity is a reality. We published last year, I think we were the first ones to actually publish this and call it out, the power law of models. You're going to have large models and you're going to have especially models come in. Right. Turns out that's where the action is. And you guys are actually doing that with the, the lightweight models as well. Because you give a small model, it'll be highly valuable. Everyone knows that now. Right. Okay, now you have model interaction. 
So what's going on is the use case of say Georgia Pacific, coming back to that, is that they built their own AI stack based on what they needed, the latency requirements. Right. Okay, huge end-to-end -end requirement. That's a net new, that was, that was generated because of generative AI. So generative is a whole other category of new things that you, it can be different. It's okay to be different from one workload to the other. Why? Because the workload's different. Right. So there's no general purpose AI in my opinion. That's my, my view. So that comes back down to cloud. So cloud operations is now standard. Cloud on-premise edge. They all got to work together. Mm -hmm. So when we get back to the end-to-end -end workloads, and I got to manage that data, how do you guys see your customers implementing the new stack, the new generative AI models on existing workloads, net new workloads that were built from scratch because of generative AI, and the full, I call, tear the house down and rebuild, right? So there's a yeah. full rebuild, retrofit, net new. There's three use cases that we're seeing. How can you guys unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, I, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Um, no. uh, so the um, it, this obviously is a is a point for a much much larger discussion uh, over and above the cube. But I think one of the first things we've seen with a lot of our customers is they always work backward from the use case that um, they're trying to resolve. I was talking to a customer not too long ago, just a couple of days ago. One of the things they were trying to do is uh, they were trying to understand patient outcomes in healthcare. Now they had a very clear idea what it is that they wanted to measure in terms of metrics, but what they weren't clear about is, okay, what are all the intervening steps that happen before somebody goes into, I don't know, diabetic shock, for instance? Okay, what's the data that they have? So to be able to do things like being able to retrofit or to be able to build upon existing use cases, one of the first things they look at is, you know, what does my data look like, number one? What kind of infrastructure do I have the data currently stored in? What kind of cleansing that I have to do? What kind of analytics do I have to put in place? Can I do <laughs> things with regular analytics that I have from the machine learning world, or do I have to go with large language models? And if so, what are the, what's the price to performance comparison that I have to deal with to be able to get those things up? So there are, as you can imagine, the highly unsatisfactory answer I'm going to give you right now is that there are a number of these components that first need to be looked at. Data, infrastructure, types of models, how you do the model management, yeah. how you actually look at, how you curate the models over time, how do you look at performance of models over time. These are some of the things that they look at from the standpoint of whether to retrofit, or whether to do a brand new use case, yeah. or whether to actually continue some of the existing work. You need system architecture. It's, you have to bring systems thinking to the table. Uh, yes, you get you look do. look at everything. Yes, you do, but you also have the struggle of figuring out how to be able to Got make it. all of the mesh, um, which, which is what we've been working with SAS to be able to do that. Not sure if that, yeah. that made No, that's perfect. I totally agree with what you said. I think that the other interesting thing is that the partnership together brings a complete cohesive tool set to the table, regardless of if it's a new use case, a retrofit use case, or something, again, that, that has yet to be explored. I think together we can bring, again, tools that, that help yeah. meet the needs of our customers in the moment that they need it in. I think it's part of the compelling reason why I think the partnership's been so successful. You know, I mean, the big theme of the show, or maybe not theme, but message that we've heard loud and clear is that, look, it's not just about the LLM, there's so many other components around the LLMs. Um, I think both your firms understand that quite well. Having said that, LLMs getting a lot of attention yes. these days. So, and AWS is making the assumption that model diversity is the right strategy for customers. Absolutely. Working backwards from the customers. There's two ends of the spectrum on this discussion. One end says, well, all the, model, the models are going to be commoditized. The AWS end of the spectrum, I would say, and not to put words in your mouth, is no, that's not the case. John, you've even said, if innovation continues, they're not going to be commoditized. The combinatorial effects of being able to understand model management, right fit, price performance, right. energy, et cetera, is going to insulate those models from being commoditized. I mean, a CAO, you maybe wouldn't mind if they're commoditized. Man, it makes your life easier. Where do you guys land on that? Try to give me as an objective on what answer model, as, model as, as possible on, on commoditization of, of LLMs. Um, look, um, at some point in time, I'm sure, the number of firms who are developing LLMs is going to increase, that's for sure. But, to develop an LLM is no simple affair. Mm. It takes billions of dollars to be able to develop an LLM, any LLM of any kind. So you know, Amazon's come a long way, not just with Bedrock, which is our managed services. Uh, we have our own model called Titan. We have a bunch of other models from Anthropic and Hugging Face and whatnot. You saw the announcement today, Llama. So I don't believe we're anywhere near commoditization. These models are extremely purpose-built. They are very use case-driven. It's going to be a while before 
I don't even know if we're going to ever get to that point where we find the magic to commoditize them. Mm -hmm. Today, AWS has made strategic investments in the generative AI space and continuing to do so at a very, very high pace. And we believe that these are models that are going to be used for specific reasons. They can, of course, be used in combination, uh, depending on the use case you're looking at. But I don't see them being commoditized uh, for a while. And happy to take bets. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's more players in in for sure. It, you're exactly right, incredibly expensive to continue to build. They're also a moment in time that challenges some of the usefulness in the enterprise, and so I think one of the places that SaaS is going is smaller models, perhaps some that, that augment or can help ensure the integrity of the answer that might come back from an LM. We saw that yesterday on stage from SaaS's announcements. So I, I, you know, will, it, will models be com com commoditized? I don't know that they will, perhaps on the LMs because again, be, there will be more, somewhat naturally happens with more play. I think those industry specific models, those right. models that are a little bit more built for purpose um, for, a, for a particular enterprise use case, Absolutely. those will have, and have sustained value in my opinion. We're well, aligned with you on that, by the yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, we I, we don't gone, believe in the commoditization <laughs> yeah. strategy. I think you took it very Actually, well. Actually, Matt Wood jumped, on one of the came, in, came into my LinkedIn on that one. Yeah, thing. And, yeah. And, 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 have, and having said that, consolidation, probably likely, because it's so Absolutely. expensive, yeah. Yeah. and mass customization right. you know, for particular models. And, and you almost and, have to do it, right? With yeah. the contextual data you put in place, customization is in inevitable. And we're fine with that, that we expect that to happen, and we yeah. want that to happen. Yeah. Right. But in terms of models being commoditized, I don't see that. They, might, they, they, they might be obsolete. That, I think obsolescence is oh, a bigger sure. conversation. Maybe, yeah. If you're not good, yeah. you got it. Right. If right. you don't meet like the SLA, Brian and I just talked about in this last segment, if you don't meet certain thresholds, you're not even in the conversation to be considered. I agree. I Absolutely. mean, this is where the game is changing. It's yeah, not yeah. like you can't, I just think you can't hang a, around. There's no technical debt anymore. It's called technical, you're out of business. Yeah, but, right. but, but you're billing to do. My point <laughs> is, it's, I think it's, I would love to hear a CIO's perspective on this. I think it's a dangerous assumption to sit back and say, well, it's going to be commoditized, so I don't really have to Invest. Invest in the, yeah. in the customization for right, my business. Right. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. You can't uh, wait. Uh, uh, yeah, right? You can't I mean, wait. I, if you're sitting on the sidelines and you're waiting for that, that price to come down or right. waiting for someone else to figure it out and then you'll inherit it, you're, you're, you know, your competition's going to pass you by. Yeah. Well, the, you know, you're the, the be... CIO could look at it and say, hey, I, it's, if it's not commodity, it means it's valuable. I'm going to invest in it. That's right. So the, so the commodity question, to me, goes the wrong way. Okay, commodity means it doesn't cost that much. I can get a lot of it anywhere. Yeah. I would say from that standpoint, the big, big models are more commoditized than anything else. Yeah. The, so I think the investment is not about the commodities, it's about how is the value extracted. Is. And keep in mind, that intellectual capital is yours. You don't have to share it. With commodity, it's different. And, right. and so to that extent, it is to SaaS's advantage, it is to AWS's advantage for us to be able to invest heavily, which we are. Yeah, of course. The last three minutes we have, I want to get two things out. One, I want to quote Swami, who runs the data division over there. This kind of illustrates why I think you guys are aligned. I want to get your reaction on this. Customers need, this is a tweet from this, today, this morning. Customers need assurance that their generative AI workloads, dash, that contain highly valuable sensitive data, dash, are private and protected. He goes on to say some of the things that are Amazon related, but that's a core thesis of this show that the workflow mm -hmm. is the customer's intellectual property. And that workflow and data, which you guys have a lot of experience, one with, with customers, and experience managing and applying math to, and statistics, and compute, right. is the new asset. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think we, what you're seeing in our, uh, in our portfolio and the way we're going to market with our customers and trying to engage their success is 100% trying to help them from the bottom up. So we have the tooling, again, we either through partnerships or within our own portfolio, and we want to help them imagine what that looks like, and that does become their IP at the end of the day. That is their secret sauce for why their business will right. succeed. That's right. And you know, Swami's a legend at Amazon, as you know, keep alumni as well. Yes. I mean, he's hardcore on this too. He's, yes. he, they want more open data. Absolutely. They want transparency, but the privacy's huge. Yes. yes. This is important for the workload, so when people start rethinking how to apply yep. Generative AI, whether it's a retrofit, rebuild, or net yeah. new, you got to do. You got to understand and, and the role. And he's rightly worried about the ethics of it, right? What happens if it gets in the wrong hands? Yeah. What What happens if that privacy is abused? I mean, what happens if there are certain bits of information that you should never be in right. in possession of? And I think you know, Swami's putting very thoughtful, uh, uh, innovative efforts towards making sure security yeah. and privacy are front yeah. and center mm -hmm. of that whole approach. I thought, I thought Reggie did a great job this morning, yes. main stage around it, especially when it came to data maker. So SAS is offering right around creating that synthetic right. data. So if it is highly sensitive, is there a way to augment it, change it, mask yeah. it in a certain way that still makes it applicable and using the models? 
Um, and then also a great way to also represent underrepresented data, right. if you yeah. will, in the data sets that you're going to mine. Yeah. I think this point is really why not only you guys have a good partnership with the managed service, it also shows where the money's going to be made, the monetization right. results are going to be whoever can make their business run better, not just have tech. The text just the glue, it's pervasive, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. Yeah. So final question before we wrap up real quick. Where's this partnership go next? Talk about the relationship. Obviously, Amazon's got a lot of customers. I was speculating on our analyst segment that you put SaaS in the marketplace. That's a dangerous, that's a going to be, boom, revenue, so you know. <laughs> we dipped our toe in that water. Yeah. Uh, so 360 being in the marketplace was a, a key decision for us. Yeah. Um, I think you'll yeah. continue to see more innovation yeah. there. It's something we're excited about. Um, Obviously, tremendous reach with their customer portfolio. We're excited about. We have a, uh, I'll say, a, a intense compute intensive install base ourselves. And then I think we're solving real world problems with artificial yeah. intelligence yeah. today at the enterprise level. And so our customers are naturally going to come to the, the to the two kings in the, you know, in the in the arena. Jay Shree, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Thanks for having us here, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, much appreciated, thank you for everything. All right, awesome. Yeah, thank you for All right. thank Live you. here thanks on the guys. show floor, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. You're watching theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's leading tech coverage. How are we going to Price Tech? We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>